Cool. So we are live. Um, ladies and gentlemen, happy Saturday. I um, hope you're enjoying your weekend um, so far. I think we're going to have a good um, good weather, which is going to be awesome. And uh, today, um, I have absolute honor of uh, bringing someone into our community in this, this big group. And she's going to be sharing with you her story. Now, just to give you some context to this amazing person is, um, this person has literally, um, you know, started business about 8.5 months ago. She's established herself as an industry leader. She has thousands of followers on her social media, generated tens of thousands of pounds in sales, uh, even during the global pandemic that we have been going on, which is just amazing, and works with clients across the globe to help their, uh, them and their Labradors uh, with happier lives together. Um, she's now also said goodbye to shift work um, and has created a new life away from the police, living life on her terms as a proud entrepreneur. So ladies and gentlemen, please join me in welcoming Vicky Sharp. Vicky, how are you? I'm really well, thank you, Alex. Um, the interesting thing there is you were saying that you mentioned that I just kind of moved away from the police and probably you saw a smile on my face as soon as you said that. So that makes me happy. Thanks for having me today. It's, um, it's great to be chatting with you. Awesome stuff. Awesome. Um, so what I'd like to start off by um, asking you is, um, where are you from, Vicky? And what was it like for you growing up uh, as a child? Okay, so um, I'm actually from your hometown, Alex. I, I grew up in Nottingham, which is where I spent the first 20 years of my life. So my childhood was was always kicking around sort of the, the southern part of Nottingham. A very happy childhood. It was me, my sister and my parents. Um, you know, a very normal sort of childhood, really. Didn't really like school that much. Um, always found it a bit of a chore having to go to school. And, you know, there were days where I just simply didn't bother. I didn't really like going to school. Didn't like being told what to do. Um, I was not academic at all. I loved to do things. I, I wasn't very good at, you know, sitting and listening and, and doing all that learning. So I kind of did school on my own terms, really. It was when I felt like it. Um, a little bit rebellious as time went on. And then I decided that actually learning was not for me. I just wanted to go and earn money. That's that's what I wanted to do. I had no great idea of what I was going to spend this money on, but I just wanted to go to work. Um, I'd always been brought up with my parents going out and working hard to you know support us. And I just wanted to do the same. So when I got to, to 13 years old, I decided that I was going to blag my way into going and work in a pub. So I... Um, Told them I was 15 um, just to get a bit of extra pocket money at the weekend, but actually I was a 13 year old just turning up and pretending I was a little bit older so I could earn some money. Um, and I did that a lot. I did that every Saturday and every Sunday. And I really started to enjoy earning that money. They only paid me like £2.20 an hour. It was wow. dreadful I'm thinking back, but you know, getting that paycheck at the end of the week really made it worthwhile for me. Um, that then caused me to start bunking off school quite a lot because I used to bunk off school just to go to work and earn some more money. That was, you know, what I wanted to do. So my first sort of, well, sorry, the last couple of years at, at secondary school in particular were not very productive for me at all because I was, I was rarely there. Um, managed to flunk my way through a couple of exams and get some really low grades, but nothing to, to write home about at all. Um, I desperately just wanted to carry on this, this work journey. So um, I wanted to go and do any job I could. So I had a nice little job in retail, um, which was great. Again, not the best job in the world, but it's something I enjoyed doing. Loved getting that paycheck. And you know, that first monthly paycheck was the best thing ever. Mm -hmm. Had no idea what I wanted to do with my life, really. Didn't want to go to college. Didn't want to go to uni. My parents were probably tearing their hair out all the way through my childhood. <laughs> sort of disappearing off to the, the future with, with no skills, no qualifications, but actually I just wanted to go and earn that cash. Um, I worked a lot in retail. I worked for WH Smiths in Nottingham City Centre and that's where I would be found most days. And you know, I loved it. That, that was kind of my thing, working with people, interacting with loads of different people. Um, and fortunately my managers there kind of saw that I was quite good at that type of thing. So they put me through lots of training and that really gave me a kickstart to wanting to achieve a little bit more with my life. So they put me through lots of management training and 
and kind of that's where my work ethic really sort of kicked in uh, at WH Smith in Nottingham City Centre. Amazing, amazing. So uh, how old were you when you went to a WH Smith's as a, you know, working there? Um, I remember going for my first interview when I was 15 and they offered me the job and then I had to send my birth certificate and stuff in. And they said, actually, we've made a mistake. We thought you were older. We can't take you on until you're 16. So, um, you know, we had, had a couple of months wait before I could actually go and do it properly. Um, but it just kind of shows you that I was always willing to try and do things before I was really allowed to do them. Yes. Yes. <laughs> With a common theme, absolute common yeah. theme there. So I kind of have an idea in my head and I've just got to go for it and, and get on with it, really. Amazing. So you're this time with WH Smith. Um, you're obviously enjoying it. Um, when did the idea of the police start creeping in? When did, when did that start playing on your mind? Um, it was just before my 20th birthday. Mm -hmm. um, I really loved what I was doing. I loved retail. I liked sort of the retail management side of it, which I was then in. But I just thought, I don't think I can do this for the rest of my life. You know, I'm working six days a week. I've not got my weekends off. I, I just want to do something a bit different. So I toyed with a couple of ideas. And one of them was joining the military in some form, just because I thought, you know, it's a job where I can kind of do stuff rather than sit and think too much. Um, or I can join a service or go and work for the council, some, a nice secure job where I'm going to get a pension. Um, not going to be made redundant, um, just have a bit of a, a secure future. And I remember putting an application into Nottinghamshire Police and they sent a letter back going, we're not actually recruiting at the moment, um, but we'll keep your records um, just in case anything comes up in the future. And then I sat at home one night and I was just searching the internet looking for, for different types of jobs and this advert just popped up for MOD Police. Mm -hmm. And I thought, okay, well, I've never heard of them. I'll I'll look at that because that might be a nice kind of middle ground between the military and, and the conventional police. So I, I just applied for it there and then sent them my application pack. And, and three months later, um, I was sat in a police training center um, on my first day of training. I kind of blitzed through that process extremely quickly. I was very, very, very fortunate that I timed it right. Um, and that was kind of the first idea of police. And I have to say, I kind of, I fell into it really. It's, it was not part of the grand plan. It was just something that happened. And I'm really grateful that that's the, the path that I went down really. Wow, amazing. So how old was you at this point when you were sat in that classroom at the you know police training center? 20 years old. So 20, wow. yeah, so 20 years old, just decided to join as a copper. And I remember turning up on the first day and I was probably one of the youngest there. Um, and then a few weeks into the course, you know, I thought actually this is, this is really big stuff. There's a lot of, a lot of weight on my shoulders now i'm in this room with you know 20 30 other coppers that have always had this as their plan and i've i've just turned up and you know blagged it from day one really so i need to sort of really pay a bit of attention and make it work which is is what i did um and as a, a 20 year old that's just moved away from home to start this job you know i moved 200 miles away from home to to do this job and then they gave me a firearm and I was like, well, this is, you know, definitely not what I thought I would do. But, you know, it was it was a really good start into my policing career. Really enjoyed it. Um, and I stayed with with MOD police for, for about five years. Amazing. And what kind of like roles did you do within the MOD? So I started off for, for the first year or so at a, um, a nuclear guarding station um, in Berkshire, which was a lot of responsibility you know you've got nuclear weapons you know right under your nose you've got to make sure they're safe but I've got to say it was kind of done as dishwater it was not it didn't excite me there was lots of um standing around it's essentially you're a security guard with a with a firearm so it wasn't really my bag so I did some project work for them they kind of saw that I was keen to do other stuff and I, I got a um a nice little job it was in an office I hated that element of it but it gave me some really good insight into other stuff that was happening. So I worked on a firearms review project and then from there I went to go and do a bit of work in the control room. Um, and when that all came to an end, because it was a, a sort of a short term secondment, they said, you know, you've done really well. Thank you for all the work you've done. What would you like to do now? You know, we'll kind of scratch your back because you've helped us out. And they, they sent me to a, a nice little station in Hampshire, which was much busier. 
um, and that was really a community policing role for defence families. So, you know, we covered everything from your bog standard criminal damage right the way up to, you know, attempt murders. It, it was the whole broad spectrum of, of policing and crime, really. But from, from a slightly different standpoint to your normal conventional police forces, so we were very much there just working with them and doing our own thing at the same time. So I loved it. Um, that then was coming to an end. They were going to close that station down. So I had two chances, two choices really. One was to go back to the nuclear guarding element or actually apply to a different police force, which is what I decided to do. So I, um, I popped my application in for, for Thames Valley Police and unfortunately I didn't get it. And I was a bit shocked with that because that was probably the first time that, you know, I've not just got what I wanted. Yeah. Um, you know, I'm, I'm nothing special, but actually normally I think of something I want to do and I make it happen. And it really made me think, shit, you know, I've now got to start thinking about it a little bit more. So it took a bit of time and then applied for Hampshire Police. And I was really lucky. I, I blitzed the interview with that and I transferred straight in and, and then ended up being in the, the bright lights of Basingstoke, which was um, a bit of an eye opener, really. Okay, amazing, amazing. So you've gone transferred to Hampshire now. Um, What's Hampshire like compared to, you know, MOD? Um, in some ways, it was very different. It was, it was much busier. Um, it was less disciplined. And that really shocked me because I kind of thought every police force would be the same, you know, professional people doing great jobs. I was a little bit shocked and disappointed when I joined Hampshire because it, it was less so than what I'd been used to. Still a great force, but not quite what I'd expected. Um, but the bit I really loved was the teamwork. You know, we had a team of maybe 20 people and they come part, become part of your family. You go through the best and worst. And so um, it was a very enjoyable experience. I loved it, loved every minute of it. Um, and I was on a response shift. So, you know, dealing with anything and everything. Saw it as a great challenge and a lot of fun. Um, I stayed there for about five years on that response shift. Mm -hmm. um, and I decided that a change was probably due because I was enjoying it. I still loved it, but I probably lost a bit of my passion for the job that I was doing. I decided that I loved it because of the people I was working with in the environment, not necessarily the job I was doing. And I felt myself caring a little bit less about the job I was doing. And that, that worried me because I joined the police to help people, not to just go through the motions, fill out a bit of paperwork and then forget about it. That, that didn't sit comfortably with me. So um, I decided to change role. And um, some people think this is a crazy move, but I actually joined the roads policing unit, so I became a traffic officer. So um, one of the cops that everyone loves to hate, because <laughs> funny bunch, you know. Um, there's some strange characters on, on roads policing, um, and it's a very, very different job. So went off to do that. Um, probably was a bit of a mistake because I realised that I was perhaps a different type of character to the conventional traffic officer um, and it was tough it was tough for the first year or so just to kind of try and fit in with with the old school that we have on on roads policing units so so that was a tough move for me but one that actually works out okay in the end um, and that's probably where my policing career really started to change actually so maybe six months into that, something happened at work, which, which kind of changed my life almost overnight. And, you know, I'm not going to go into the, the great story of it here and now, but, um, you know, it really made me think that policing is, is not now for me. Um, it changed my life drastically. I realised that the job did not care less about me. I was very much just, I was PC25102. That's where it ended, you know my um my life actually didn't mean anything to them um and i picked up quite nasty injuries after an incident and it it really sort of rocked my world a little bit um but i was desperate that it wouldn't impact on what i was doing because policing was what i loved that's what i wanted to carry on doing it was it was kind of the plan it was the job i was going to do forever so i picked up some injuries and it was really starting to affect what i was capable of doing but i didn't want that to become an issue I didn't want people to know so I carried on just regardless without making a big issue of it and that went on for about four years and outside of work I was kind of going through 
some pretty nasty battles with, you know, the emotions and the physical injuries that I picked up, um, which made going to work really tough. It stopped being enjoyable. It was just going through the motions to get my wage at the end of the month, just to prove that I could still do it. Um, and maybe just over a year ago, we, we got sent to like psychological screenings just to make sure that we were all physically and mentally well enough to do the job. And I'd already blacked my way through a couple of these and gone, yeah, everything's fine. I'm fit, I'm healthy, mentally, I'm totally sound. And then I met this one guy at Oki Health and he kept probing. He realized something wasn't quite right. Mm. And I sat there in his office and just had a bit of a meltdown. You know, it was not planned, but I had a bit of a breakdown. And he obviously realized that, you know, things have not been right for a while. And that was the, the turning point for me where I thought, actually, this is making me quite ill not good um, something's got to change so I changed the roles that I was doing within the roads policing unit and I really did start to focus on my family liaison officer work so that's kind of the really caring bit of, of the, the job so all of the road deaths that we dealt with I would be the one that's dealing with the family so that's, it's a really emotional job to do anyway but it was it was the nice side of it I felt like I was being really valuable to people doing that um, so focused on that and then um, that's when I really started to think, actually, my policing career needs to come to an end and I've got to start focusing on something else, which, which is where the story develops even more to, to me coming to you, Alex. <laughs> wow, that's, that's amazing. Thank you so much for sharing that. Um, you know, it is, I think it's a common theme as well that people try and um, like oh, forget about it, but things do crop up in the future. So, um, you know, thank you so much for sharing that. Um, so how did you... First of all, why did you not think about getting another job straight away? Um, there's nothing that I wanted to do. Policing was it. And then I thought about, you know, maybe I'll just jack it in. I'll go and work in co-op or Waitrose, whatever, just to earn money to pay my mortgage, give me a bit of breathing space and then think, right, now I'll go and get this job somewhere else. Um, so that was an option. I looked at what could I do in, you know, other industries and I thought I'm not qualified to do anything. You know, I've, I've worked in retail. That didn't give me any qualifications. I went to school. That didn't really give me any qualifications because I didn't put any effort in. I've kind of done, you know, at that point, 10 years in the police. That gave me loads of skills, but nothing that I felt I could transfer into a different job. So I felt a bit lost. I just didn't know where to go, what I would be good at. And everyone kept saying to me, you've got loads of skills as a copper that are really going to help you. But I couldn't, I couldn't see what those skills were or how, how I could even start selling those to a different employer. So I was probably a little bit scared of going to do something else. And it was just comfortable staying in the police. Knew that pension was there at the end of it. I was kind of just going to turn up every day. It was an easy job. You know, I've done it for long enough that everything I did was, was easy. So going through the motions just to kind of get that pension in 30 years time that's probably why i carried on doing it okay interesting awesome stuff got some comments saying huge inspiration uh, just read your story vicky on google uh, kudos to you uh, very inspiring awesome so keep the uh, comments up guys we appreciate that um so how did you come across shift success how did you find me how did you find the team um, my other half, actually, Christian, he, um, he sent me a link to your quiz and I, I looked at it and I, I dismissed it. I thought, oh, just someone else wants my details to try and sell me something. So um, I didn't really give you a second thought once he sent me that link. I thought, it's just a load of rubbish. Yeah. Um, and then I think I saw some other things online. I must have seen an advert or something crop up and I, I was probably having a really bad day and I thought, I just need to do something. So I filled out your quiz, um, which I, you know, we've discussed before. I hate the idea of filling out quizzes online, but I did it anyway. And it, it clearly worked because we ended up having a chat. Um, I spoke with one of your team and I just kind of got filled with a bit of confidence. Do you know what? I can do something else. Um, and then you kindly sent me one of your books and I, I sat at work one day while I was on sort of some restricted duties and I read that book. And it just really kind of gave me the enthusiasm to think, you know what, I can do something. Don't know what it's going to be, but um, yeah, I'm going to give it a go. So got in touch with you, came to one of the quick start days and I brought Christian with me and we, we both 
throughout that whole session just kept sort of getting these ideas in our head of what we could do, what I might like to do. And I left with like a page full of stuff at the end of the day of little ideas of what I could do with my life. Um, and very quickly just dismissed them all because I thought, can't do it, can't do it, not good at that. Um, and then as we were driving home, we were discussing the option of signing up to one of the cohorts, one of the accelerators. And again, I owe all this to Christian because he was the one that pushed me into it and go, just do it, you know, make a go of it. Because I was in my head dismissing it, thinking I'm not good enough. I haven't got an idea. It's not going to work. I'm not good enough. Um, and he very much kind of ushered me towards signing up for a cohort. Um, I was worried about that. You know, I came to you with absolutely no idea of what I might do. I sat there on day one and thought, God, all these people around me have got some really quality ideas of what their business is gonna be. And I remember on day one, I kind of stood up in front of the group and sort of said a little bit about my story and then said, but I have no idea what I want to do. I want to do something outdoors. I don't want to sit at a desk. I like the countryside. And that was kind of all I'd got, those, you know, that little criteria could not think for the life of me what it was going to be. And we had, we had a little chat on Zoom, didn't we? And we kind of really delved into what excited me, not necessarily what I was good at, but the things that I would enjoy doing. And um, we came up with dog training and seemed a bit weird to start with because I thought I've never trained a dog in my life. You know, I've got dogs, I love dogs, I like being with dogs, but actually I'm not sure I'm qualified to go and train dogs. But suddenly when we really start looking into it, it was the perfect idea for me. And then that really focused me to go and get good at doing it. Um, I've got goosebumps. Uh, it's, yeah. it's just such an incredible story. And I can remember the sequence of events leading up until, you know, where you are right now. Um, we, we get a lot of people who don't want to go into business or, you know, feel like they can't go into business because they haven't got an idea. They, they, they get stuck in their own head. And it's one of those things, if you don't know the knowledge, you're not going to just remark, you know, remarkably come up with an idea. So for you, no business experience whatsoever. You've been a cop for many, many years. Um, you've got no previous business experience whatsoever. Um, what I know you mentioned Christian, was there anything else that really thought, you know, I've, I've got to do this? Because that's quite a scary feeling, right? No idea, no experience. You're going into a different industry. You know, what, what made you urge step forward despite of all that? Um, I think part of it was knowing that I had to leave the police, whatever. I just knew I needed to leave. So I needed to do something else. And I'd already kind of realized that I did not want to go and work for someone else because those people that I'd probably go and work for would annoy the crap out of me. I wouldn't get, you know, I don't like, um, I like to do my thing when I want to do. I didn't want to be stuck in an office. So I knew I'd got to kind of just make it work. I wanted to have weekends back. I wanted to have evenings. I wanted to decide when I wanted to work. If I wanted to take a two week holiday in July, then I was gonna do it. And I was sick of being held back by that previous regime of the police that tells me when I can take time off, what I can do and when I can do it really. So that was my sort of main drive is knowing what I wanted to achieve. I just needed to find a way to, to make it happen. And that's, that's why sort of going into business was, was my drive really. Amazing. It really sounds like you've thought about the design of the life you want. You already thought about your ideal life, which is, is amazing. So I know what you do and uh, some, you know, the cohorts know what you do, but for those who are watching, who don't know who you are, if I was going to bump into you in a pub and I said to you, Vicky, you know, what do you do? How would you tell me what you do? So um, I have a business called Tales of Success and we're a dog training and behavioral company specifically for Labrador breeds. Um, we give dog owners, Labrador owners, knowledge, skill, support to allow their Labrador at whatever age to kind of fit seamlessly into their family life. So we want to create the best Labrador pet that you can have. We want them to be part of your family. And we're going to show you how to do that. It's about kind of building respect between you and your dog and just having the best time ever and understanding each other. That's what we do. Amazing. I can see a massive smile on your face. It's awesome. <laughs> um, why Labradors? Uh, Labradors are the, um, the breeds that I currently have as my pets. I've got two, one's 12 and one's 14. Um, I'm a little bit biased and 
Katie Slaywell, Kelly Wynn, Mark, <laughs> and disagree, but Labradors are the best dogs. Simple as that. <laughs> <laughs> I like it. I like it. Got some uh, hearts going off right now. Um, so what kind of problems do your customers face with uh, Labradors? So when when we first started this, this venture out, I was finding that it's it was always with older dogs. You know, they'd had these Labradors for maybe three or four years and they just got to the point where everything was so frustrating and the dog was pulling on the lead, barking uncontrollably. They had no control. So people were had these big problems that they'd let fester for like three or four years and then they were kind of going somebody please help me because it's not working um labradors are seen as a very docile breed that you know they're a bit overweight they sort of plod behind you and people think that's what their labrador is just going to be like and actually unless you put the time and effort in you're never going to get that sort of docile dog you're going to get a very excitable dog so they are the problems that people were were really sort of having, and that's nice because we can show them some nice results relatively quickly, and it's almost a bit of a light bulb moment. They go, "Oh yeah, I've been doing it wrong for four years, and now just in six weeks of training, we've really turned it around. We've got a better relationship um, with our dogs." So they were the problems that people were facing. Um, kind of changed the business model quite a lot recently, just because of the lockdown. So. Now it's less about solving a problem and it's more about preventing a problem happening. So very much targeting puppies and preventing those problems before they start developing. Amazing. Absolutely incredible. Um, you mentioned something earlier that when you, um, you know, you've got no experience, business experience whatsoever, but, and you haven't been in dog training before in your life, but you said it's, it's now time to get the best at it. Right. Um, with regards to, going into this industry and you know did you ever think for, you know bloody hell I've got I've got customers now how, how do I how do I deal with this for the first time what what how did you overcome that fear or did you not have any fear and no I had fear you know I was walking into an industry there's hundreds of thousands of dog trainers out there I'm, I'm not unique there's you know everywhere you turn there's dog trainers so I thought how am I going to be different so when people are approaching me or I'm going out to prospect to my new customers I think, what, why am I going to be different? And there were times where people said, you know, I really want to sort this problem out. And I thought, to be honest, in the beginning, I didn't really know how I was going to sort it out. And it's something that either you said or one of the other mentors said, it was say yes and then figure out how the heck you're going to do it. <laughs> and I had, I had those moments to start with. I was like, yes, I can definitely help you. I can, I can make it work. And in my head, I was maybe thinking, I'm going to have to go away and really learn about this topic now to make sure I can help them the best. So what I did is I stopped kind of seeing it as fear and just like, this is a great opportunity for me to learn a new skill and help this person. So my big bit of advice to people is don't sweat it. Just, just say yes and then go and figure it out. That's amazing advice. Amazing advice. Um, explain what that first sale was like for you how did you feel what did you do did you hug christian you know what explain what happened so through the cohort process you know you teach us about you know how to go out and get your first sale filling out forms and taking payment and all that sort of stuff so i've got all this ready so when i finally got my first two consultations with people i drove to them and i drove to three different people in one day and i covered quite a lot of miles you know going to see them because I thought I really want to get in front of them meet them in person find out about their problems and at the end of it then I would kind of hit them with the price and I'd already decided on this price and I decided my price was actually going to be higher than most of the dog trainers out there because I needed to just test to see what was going to work for me and I'd spent an hour with this first lady just talking about her dog how we could help um, she seemed kind of a little bit interested but not overly interested so I thought well I'll hit her with this price and say you know are you in I hit her with the price and there was absolutely no reaction at all good or bad she just kind of looked at me and I said so do you want to go for it are you going to think about it and she goes no no I'll go for it here's my card and I kind of said it out loud I was like god that was easy I you know I, was, I said it in front of her because it was <laughs> it, it was really easy to do um 
And that was great. I left there thinking, wow, if they can all be this easy, that is, that is a proper result. I then drove to the next house to do exactly the same. And I walked into this house and I, I'd written off the customer already because I'd, I'd kind of judged a book by its cover and I thought, these are not my customer. These are not kind of the people that are going to want to work with me and, and the prices that I'm going to want to charge them. And again, I spent an hour kind of just showing them the value of what I could do for them. And again, they signed up. They, they made phone calls to friends and family to get the cash together because they really wanted the results that I'd offered them. Um, that was an amazing feeling because they really wanted to work with me. Um, and I came home and I kind of showed Christian these two completed order forms. And I was like, look what I did today. And, you know, I earned that first day, I earned the best part of £800. Just you know, my first two sales, I've just put £800 in a bank. And I thought, that's amazing. That's, you know, a good day's work. I felt really good about it. But I've still not trained their dogs at this point. So there's a lot of pressure to really go out and deliver them results for the money and time that they're going to put in. Yeah, amazing. And I think this is going to lead on to it. So we've got some uh, question from Kirsty Mills. How do you get the capital to launch your business? Did you have to borrow it from the bank? Absolutely not. So um, there was no capital in here. I um, listened to your advice, Alex. You, you talk a lot about bootstrapping your business. There is nothing that's gone into my business really that has cost me a huge amount of money. So signing up to Shifts to Success, that's a financial outlay, but I made that back very quickly. The only other thing that's cost me money is actually putting myself through the training, which is, you know, it's not hugely expensive. Um, I was fortunate. I've got a little bit of savings, which I could use for that. Um, everything else that I've done is, is, you know, when money comes in, I spend a little bit of money on something else or my design and my, um, my marketing, I do myself. No one else is helping me. My, my only other outlay is to um, a great little company called Wolf Designs that did my website. And, you know, that has been my only outlay, really, which, you know, you negotiate terms with your suppliers and maybe choose some payment options, which is what I did. Um, but spending the money really does bring it back in. That's what I would say. So don't think it's going to cost you a huge amount of money because it really doesn't amazing it's great advice and what you did as well which is amazing is that what you've told everyone is that you sold the idea before you actually delivered the product yeah. so a great way i'm mean, elon musk's done it you know some of our other cohort members do it is bringing the sales first and then using those sales those funds to then invest in the development or to deliver your product or service and you can actually bootstrap your way to a very successful business which we'll go on to uh, in a second um You've now, you know, you've brought in 800 for your first uh, day, what well, your first sales. Um, you've now doubled and doubled and doubled your your, your pro product prices. How does it feel? Because I just want to give some context to this because it, it is mind-blowing. You've gone from the police in 8.5 months with no previous business experience. You've now got a global successful business generating tens of thousands of pounds and you're solving your customers' problems, you've got a tribe following as well. How does that make you feel compared to, you know, where you was in, in the police? Um, it's, it's amazing. It's kind of a little bit unbelievable still. You know, I think I'm really lucky to have this. It just feels great because every day is, is fun. Every day is different. Every day is kind of what I want to do. Um, so it does, it feels incredible. It's happened really fast. Um, I just feel really grateful that it has happened, really. It's as, it's as simple as that. Amazing, amazing, amazing stuff. Um, what does it feel like working with international clients? Um, how's, that, how's that dynamic? Um, it's cool, yeah. So, you know, this last week alone, I've had um, two customers from the States that have just signed up. So we've started training with them. That's, that's different, you know, the way in which they deal with their dogs and the relationships they want with their dogs is slightly different. So we've had consultations with people in the States, India, Canada, Australia. Um, the, the power of kind of social media really does mean that we haven't got boundaries. And it's, it's really nice to think that, you know, people across the other side of the globe are coming to little old me that, you know, eight months ago was a copper and they want to work with me. I'm not chasing those people. It's now, 
you know people want to come to me because of what we've built and they've heard good things hopefully well obviously they have because they've come to me yeah that's right it's amazing it, and it is you know um reputation is its own currency and and that is building you've become an industry leader which is it's just it's amazing you deserve it um so one thing i'm getting from you vicky um in the really i've only really known you for about eight months um since you've been with us at shift success you seem like a bit of a go-getter and yeah. hearing your story now that you've just told me that's the kind of the first time i've heard about you your upbringing that kind of thing um Recently, or well, about a month ago, you were posting our co-op community, um, test my pricing, sold, test my pricing, gone for it again, and gone for it and doubled and doubled. Where does that mindset come from with you? Because going out there and increasing your product prices and testing that can be quite a scary feeling for a lot of people. What is it with you where you just, right, I'm going to, you get, because you get the advice from the mentors and you run with it straight away. Where does that come from? Um. I, I trust you guys, you know, I've, I've put time and money into you to, to teach me what to do. And I kind of think I've just got to go with the process and listening to the advice that you've given, you know, Robin Waite is always talking about increase your prices, increase your prices. And um, his book actually gave me quite a lot of inspiration to just go out and do it and just see what happens. It's not about taking loads of money from people. That's not what it's about, but it's giving kind of real value to my product because I put a lot of effort into it. There's a lot of time goes into what I do. Um, so testing those prices has been tough. Sometimes it doesn't feel easy trying that price increase. And the first few times you try it, you get a couple of no's, but then when you get that first yes, you think, oh, wow, someone sees the value of what I'm offering and then it becomes much easier. And for me, I've never really, in this process, I've not really looked too much at what my competitors are doing. I keep an eye on their prices, but I don't pay much attention to it. You know, I've got one dog trainer that's about five miles away from me and she teaches Labradors as well. She charges 10 pounds per hour, um, which is ludicrous, absolutely ludicrous. And you know, the results that she gets are questionable, but I think that reflects, um, you know, I charge more, but actually I'm putting an awful lot more time into it and getting results. So, with testing your price, it is difficult. You've got to do it and you'll find your own balance really. Um, and I'm now routinely managing to charge double what I was initially. It's kind of the normal and people keep saying yes, which tells me that there is value to it still. Yeah, and probably you maybe still be a bit cheap. We'll, we'll keep testing. Yeah, so um, you know, I've, I've now kind of hit my quota of what I'm prepared to do on my current price and you're right I will keep testing that price you know from next week it's going to be tested a little bit higher again amazing <laughs> amazing stuff um so this is I think this is this next question is going to be um kind of very inspirational for a lot of people who are watching this um again just if you tune in right now you've gone from no having no previous business experience no business idea when you joined us to now having a global enterprise making tens of thousands of pounds and now you've resigned from the police service. For those who are in the job right now or in the NHS or wherever you're from watching who are really wanting that change in their life, to give some context to them, how did it feel for you handing in your resignation? Because I believe we've got quite a story around that. You picked a date in the diary and you were saying to yourself and myself, this is the day I'm going to leave, whether it's going good or bad, and you commit to that. Can you just explain a bit of the story around that? Yeah, so um, it was probably around October, November time. Um, I did a vision board at the start of my process on one of the cohorts. Part of my vision was always going to be that I would leave the police and set up a business. And actually, when I did the vision board, I didn't have that business idea at the time. So I still had no idea what I was going to do, but I decided that I needed a date to work towards that that switch was going to happen. And I set a date of 15th of June. No reason, it just seemed like a, a great time to resign from the police. Um, so I put that on paper. I announced it to um, everyone within our cohort group to make sure that people were going to hold me accountable. And because I'd done that, I kind of had six, eight months to go, right, whatever happens, I'm going to meet that deadline. Don't know how I'm going to do it, but we're definitely working towards that goal. 
and suddenly 15th of June comes around really quick. You know, <laughs> <laughs> when you've got that pressure, it does, it came around so, so quick. Um, but that was important to me. Had I not have set that date, made it public, I, I don't think um, I'd have put the work in and the effort that I had done because I needed to make it happen. You know, had I not made it happen, there would have been no consequence. It's just that was my goal. That was my vision. Um, having that to focus on really, really helped. So I'd say if anyone is thinking about it, set your date, make it happen, whatever, just make it happen because you won't regret it. Amazing, amazing, amazing stuff. And how does it feel like knowing that, you know, you've handed it in now, there's no going back. How, how did that feel for you? Was it a relief or was it worrying? Yeah, I think on the approach to kind of leaving the police, it was worrying because you're leaving that security. You're leaving what you've known. You know, when I left the police, I've been there for 15 years. So it's kind of, it was my life almost. So it's a huge change. I've now been sort of officially left for, you know, around about a month, I suppose. I've not looked back. Um, I don't miss it at all. I thought I would. Kind of miss the people that I worked with but not the job. I feel relieved that I don't have to get up at five o'clock in the morning to go to work. Don't have to work night shifts, don't have to work weekends. It's, um, it's a real relief. And, you know, I was driving around yesterday and I saw a couple of cop cars just parked up and I, I kind of looked at them and thought in my head, so glad I'm not you right now, you know, because I was doing what I wanted. I'd, I'd gone out for a coffee in the morning with friends, you know, seen this police car and just thought, for me, it sucks to be you. Mm. You know, I feel mm. like I made a real positive change. Yeah, amazing. Absolutely amazing. Um, Vicky, so you've done this again during COVID, okay? So you've made all these transitions during COVID, pandemic, things have been shut down. You know, the world came to a kind of a standstill. You could have quite easily said, you know what, screw this, I'm staying in the job because I don't know what's going to happen. And your mindset is testament to the results you've now got. Talk to me about the process of you pivoting your entire business model to being able to generate tens of thousands of pounds globally. So we go back to that date of the 15th of June, date that I decide I'm going to leave the police. That's a really stupid thing to do in the middle of a global pandemic. <laughs> but I decided that that was the date and I did it. And then I thought, what have I done? You know, I thought it was a really stupid decision. My family and friends probably thought it was stupid. Although quietly supportive, they probably thought, what a stupid thing to do in, in the middle of a pandemic. Um, and because I started to doubt myself, I thought, you know, every other dog trainer out there is, you know, online at the moment, in meltdown, crying because their business has just gone out the window. They can't train dogs. And I did a little bit of the same for two weeks. I just went into the garden and did some gardening and just busied myself and kind of thought, I'm just going to take a bit of time out until this all blows over. Then I'll do what everyone else is doing and get back to it. And then I had a bit of a light bulb moment. And I thought, there's still dogs out there. Dogs still need training. People are going to be at home with their dogs. They're probably going to be more frustrated than ever before. So I decided to create an entirely online training program for puppies because you know everyone's got a puppy at the moment they all need a bit of training so no one else was really doing it lots of the conventional old school dog trainers were toying with the idea of using zoom but actually really were not very confident with technology and just found it too difficult so they weren't bothering so i kind of saw a bit of a gap in the market there that there's loads of people need a trainer not many people offering that service so put pen to paper created this brilliant puppy program thought it was amazing and I offered it at a drastically reduced price as well because it was going to be all online just needed to get a bit of money to get going in my head it was the best thing ever on paper it was the best thing ever so I put these posts out on social media on the website and all that sort of stuff and uptake was you know it was okay showed a bit of interest and then when it came around to sort of discussing the price, which I thought was brilliant value, people were saying no to me. And that really kind of knocked my confidence. I thought, why are people not signing up to this brilliant training package that I'm going to offer them? Mm -hmm. um, I kind of realized that that was entirely my fault because I was selling it to them in totally the wrong way. I just sent them an email and they'd seen a list of things that I was going to teach them, but they didn't really understand why 
I was teaching them that and what results they'd get. So I kind of changed around again and I, I just changed my method of delivering you know, that initial meeting with them. So we got on phones, we did Zoom calls with everyone. And I'd probably spend about 40 minutes with each customer, just getting to know them, getting to know their dog, essentially becoming friends with them for 40 minutes. Then we would talk about the value that the training would give them. And at the very end, we talk about price. And suddenly everyone was saying yes. And I thought, this is it, you know, same product, same training, but I'm really selling them some value now and I feel like I know them. And that really made a difference to me. So that's how Puppy School really came to life when I just changed the method that I was delivering, you know, the actual value to them. So that really worked for us. I, my, my jaw's hurting from how much I'm smiling, Vicky. This is, uh, this is so <laughs> entrepreneurial and so amazing that you've, uh, you've done that. And uh, I think a lot of people do sell the wrong way. And uh, you really, you know, straight away, bang, you change that, which is amazing. And also you went against the status quo. I mean, a lot of people like away from zoom, not doing the, uh, the whole training online, you straight away jumped in and did it. And now look at you, you're you riding the wave. And, and you know, that's it. It's when I first started using zoom, I, I hated it. I was constantly just looking at myself and thinking, what are people seeing? Do I look okay? Do I sound okay? I have to say, I use Zoom now for probably eight hours a day. Don't look at myself at all. Don't care. Um, people don't care. So if anyone out there is really worried about, you know, doing things publicly, no one cares about you. They care about what you're, you're offering really. So get over yourself. Yeah. <laughs> Great yeah. advice. It just really sounds like you've, you've really put the customer at the center of your focus, which is, which is remarkable. Um, what, skill sets do you believe that you've transferred from being the police so long to now being you know the successful entrepreneur that you are um i think part of why i feel that i've done better than some other dog trainers that you know haven't been in the police before is is purely about confidence and the way that we can deal with people so you know the skills that i've learned in the police of you know you know nicking people dealing with crime not relevant at all but actually the way that we speak to people we can adapt the way we do things and say things depending on the person we're chatting to. We're great at making people feel comfortable. You know, we can pick up on those things where people are slightly anxious. So that really helps because I spend most of my time talking to people and training people to train their dogs. The dogs are just a bit of a, a byproduct, really. It's very much about people. And that's one of the, the great things that the policing has given me. It's just the ability to kind of understand people and what motivates them. Amazing with communication skills. I love it. Absolutely love it. Um, what are some of the mindset differences that, you know, you've been in the job for, you know, over, nearly 10, over 10 years, over 10 years, 15 years. 15 years, um, yeah, 15 years. What, what mindset differences have you had that have been in the 15 years in the job to now, you know, being an entrepreneur? Um, I think what I've enjoyed most is having to plan and think for myself, you know, being a cop, we do do an element of thinking for ourselves, but we're very much like, this is how it happens. This is how it's always happened. It's happened for the last 20 years like this. No one really knows why, but we're just going to blindly follow. So the mindset change for me is really start to think about what we're doing and why we're doing it. Um, and just changing, you know, adapting as things happen. As a cop, we kind of do the same thing every day because that's what we do. As an entrepreneur, you really kind of think, what am I going to do different today to make it better for, for me and for other people? So it's just having a really open mind and just changing almost by the day. Incredible. Absolutely amazing. Um, as a result of going through the process, shift success, you know, and now, you know, living a different, completely different life, what what does your life look like? You know, how, how do you feel about your future? Um, I'm really excited for the future. I have to say at the moment, I don't really know what it's going to look like in the next year or five years or where we're going because we're still quite new in the process. But I'm excited. I'm excited to have more time when I want it. Um, that's the big thing for me. Um, I feel much healthier. Um, and I think actually the business is just going to carry on growing. I do see that we're going to expand, you know, quite a bit in the next couple of years. Um, I'm now at the point where I'm going to need to start getting people on board to really sort of help me out. So I'm excited for the future. That's, um, that's the best way I can describe it. It's just exciting. 
Amazing. Because before, like in the police, your path's set, right? Until you're know, 30 years pension, maybe get another job after that. And now you've kind of, you know, it's that uncertainty. And I suppose that excites you rather than kind of worries you. Yeah, um, you're right. We kind of work in the police. We kind of know that we're going to have a set shift pattern. We're going to turn up every day. We're working towards that pension in 30 years time. Um, I've not got that anymore. You know, I'm not working just for that end goal. Actually, I'm going to enjoy the 30 years lead up to, you know, when I can retire. If I decide to go into early retirement, at, you know, the age of 45, I'll choose to do that as long as I've got the income to, to support that. So, um, yeah, I'm, I'm very excited to know that every day is going to be a little bit different as well. Amazing. Absolutely amazing. Um, I want to ask, you know, about, about Christian. Christian is obviously a big part of your life and it is just so amazing that he's given you the support um, and directed you to us at Shift's success. And hopefully he's coming to the Christmas party in December, by the way, hopefully you can meet him. And, um, you know, how does he feel knowing you've achieved this and you get to probably spend more time and you're safe and you're not putting your life on the line anymore? You know, how, how does he feel about this? Um, in some ways, I'm sure he's really pleased about it in other ways he's probably a bit annoyed because I rope him in to help me all the time so <laughs> he's probably getting a bit sick of you know filling gift packs and sending them out and going to the post office for me all the time um when when I first told him that I decided to to do dog training he was you know as supportive as ever but I kind of saw a bit of disappointment on his face as if to go you're doing what you're going to leave this good job and go to be a dog trainer and not probably not earn that much money but it's been really nice to kind of see a bit of a shift change in friends and family as well that now see that this is actually a really decent business that we've built. So um, it's nice for them to know that I'm safe, you know, particularly my mother who lives, you know, a good 250 miles away. She, she used to worry about me a lot going to work. She didn't know the half of what I experienced, but it's really reassuring for me that actually my family now know that I'm in a safe job and, you know, I'm not going to come to any harm unless, unless I do something really stupid with a dog. Um, but actually it's, it's a relatively safe job. I've got time when I want it. So actually I can go and see friends and family at the weekends and evenings, midweek if I want to. Um, and that's, that's really nice to be able to know that I'm going to be able to start going to parties, barbecues, weddings, all those kind of things that I feel like I've probably missed out on for the last 15 years. Absolutely. And so inspiring, really, really inspiring. Um, what's been a key highlight for you in your entrepreneurial uh, journey so far? I think the, the highlights kind of come weekly for me. And at the moment, I'm really focused each week, just looking at how many new customers I've taken on and seeing that grow. That for me is, is brilliant. So you know, I've kind of done a recap of what I've done over the last week. And last week was my best week ever for taking on new customers. So I feel like highlights are happening way too often. They're, and they're only little things. But each one, I just feel like is a massive win for me. Um, and, you know, the big highlight is I've left a job that was making me miserable. Didn't realise at the time how miserable, but that's a huge highlight. That's a, a life changing highlight for me. So that's probably the one that I'd really focus on. Amazing. And can, can Christian see a difference from now you're outside the job to, to, you know, being in the job? Yeah, definitely. I mean, he's, he's in a different room now listening to this. So he's probably kind of shouting going, yes, you're much better or more miserable, whatever it might be. But uh, <laughs> yeah, it's, it's nice for him to know that, you know, I'm around a little bit more, probably a little bit less stressed, um, probably a nicer person to be around at the moment, I'd say. Amazing. He's uh, he said your focus and drive to leave the job has been amazing. You're much happier being in control of your own destiny. I'm so proud of you and everything you've achieved. Um, God, Christian, you're getting me going. <laughs> right. <laughs> um, <clears throat> um, so what is your, you know, the vision for the future of, of Tales of Success? Do you want global, you know, you want to be in different continents? You, you're getting there anyway. You know, how does that vision look like for you? So a, a friend asked me this when I kind of first started on this journey and it was only ever going to be me, quite a small little outfit, you know, maybe train a couple of dogs a week, have more time to myself. That's kind of developed very quickly. Now, you know, I'm training probably eight, 10 dogs a day. Um, so 
I need to develop it more. And actually I've got a real desire to make it bigger now. So I'm going to have to get on with, with employing people to really help me with the business, whether that's more trainers. Um, again, targeting just the Labradors. We're going to stay very focused on that niche that we've got that is really working for us. It's what I'm passionate about. But actually, yes, we need to go um, bigger. We are definitely going global, even more so than at the moment. Amazing. Exciting. Really exciting stuff. Um, so tell the audience more about your online puppy school. Right. So we've mentioned it a little bit already. Um, and actually what that is, is it's, it's a brilliant program that enables puppies to come to us from almost the moment they come home. So even before they've had their vaccinations and been socialized and all that stuff, we teach them some incredible skills that are really useful to them. We're not trick trainers. We don't teach them how to roll over and give poor and all that sort of stuff. We really teach them lovely functional skills that are, are just going to set them up for, for a brilliant life. And we, we do this all via sort of Zoom training at the moment. Um, we get together once a week. We teach skills that are really important to the dog and, and their family. It changes each time, depending on what the, the owner of that dog really wants. Um, and I've kind of taken a bit of your model here, Alex, in that I hold them accountable as well. You know, they get homework, they need to practice and they have me on their back if they're not doing it. because They need to get results. Um, so I do tend to sort of pester people just to make sure their dogs are doing some really good things and really developing. Um, and people are finishing their five week course now, graduating from puppy school and really spreading the word for me. You know, we've got lots of recommendations coming from that. And people are coming back for, for two, three, three attempts at school just because they're loving it so much. So I'm really proud of what we're achieving with some puppies at the moment. It's, it's brilliant. It's amazing seeing. I, I follow you on all social media, which we'll go into in a second. But the things that your customers say about you is just a delight to see. You know, they're sharing videos of what things that you've been teaching them. And it's just it's just amazing, Vicky. It really is. Um how can people get in touch with you then? You know, what are your social media handles? Where can people reach out to you? Yeah, so um, we've got all of the social medias, but predominantly um, Twitter, not Twitter. Uh, Instagram is, is my place to hang out. So you'll find me there and it's um, at Tails Success. So T-A-I-L-S Success. Um, we've got quite a big following there, just under 2,000 at the moment. We've also got a Facebook page and a Facebook group. So it's a nice community just for Labrador owners. Um, if any of your viewers just want to kind of have a little snoop around, they're more than welcome to join as well. It's just a really nice place for Labrador owners to, to ask lots of questions and for me to give them some, some nice value. Um, or, or hit the website, which is www.talesofsuccess.co.uk. And you can contact me through there and find out a little bit more about us phenomenal and what i want to end this uh this uh podcast episode uh with is a question i ask everyone what does entrepreneurship mean to you vicky um in simple terms it's having control over my own life and choosing what to do when to do it how to do things and do things that really excite me not what someone else tells me i've got to do um building a future for myself and helping so many other people um so i'm very much living life on my terms at the moment which is is an awesome feeling absolutely incredible um vicky from myself personally and from the behalf of the team as well we have at shift success and the cohorts you inspire us daily um you're phenomenal you know i'm really excited to see what your future is going to be in you know the next eight months um and you know you make us all very 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 proud um so thank you so much for your time guys for those who are watching thank you so much for your kind comments this is going to be uploaded to the shift success podcast in the coming weeks um so please do rate and review on there i'm going to leave this video inside our facebook community and also it will be on our youtube channel as well going forward Vicky, thank you so much. And I just want to say a big shout out to Christian as well. Um, I know he's had a big influence on your life and um, you're a power couple and it's amazing to see. So uh, thank you so much, Vicky, and have a lovely weekend. Enjoying the sun. Thank you, Alex. It's been a pleasure. Take care. Bye-bye. Yeah, bye.